Hi, we are Carolina and Valentina and we are going to talk about bilingualism. What is bilingualism? Bilingualism is defined as the ability of an individual or members of a community to use two languages effectively. In 2013, Judith Kroll and Rhonda McLean wrote a paper about bilingualism and they answered the question what bilingual tell us about culture, cognition and language. In the paper, the authors explain that the use of more than one language is a natural circumstance of the human experience and they assure that bilingual speakers can choose the language they want to speak and switch from the L1 to the L2. Therefore, bilinguals spend their lives negotiating between the two languages and acquire skills to select the appropriate language in a certain context. But how do bilinguals select which language they have to use? While well, bilingual speakers are sensitive to cultural cues, cultural signs that are in the environment that show the presence of their native language, some of these cultural cues are faces and concepts. Zhang et al. made an experiment which showed that this sensitivity to cultural cues has a negative impact on bilinguals, because when bilinguals speak in the L2, in the presence of other bilinguals who share the same L1, the L2 speech is much slower. Let's suppose that there is a Chinese-English bilingual in which Chinese is the L1. His performance in the L2 in English is going to be way less hesitant in the presence of someone who doesn't share the same L1. On the contrary, if two bilinguals share the same L1 and they are speaking in the L2, their performance in the L2 is going to be more hesitant. This experiment shows us that native language cues such as faces and culture are powerful determinants of language performance. Let's now focus on the importance of faces. For infants, during the early stages of language development, the face is the primary source of information about the connection between language and the social environment. In the case of infants who are exposed to two languages from birth, the faces are a special cue to determine which language is being spoken. In a second experiment done by Zan, it is shown that Chinese-English bilinguals are similarly disadvantaged when speaking the L2 when faced with culturally specific pictures connected to the L1 experiences. So, now, unlike bilingual babies, bilingual adults may not be always sensitive to cues in the environment that signal that only one of the two languages is relevant. In fact, for instance, when reading sentences, they might activate the other language, even though the other language may not be relevant. Now, in the case of late bilinguals who are immersed in the L2, but who have acquired after living a childhood only speaking an L1, may suffer a dissociation between culture and language. We may say that the different groups of bilinguals are all sensitive to linguistic and cultural skills. However, these skills are not going to be used in the same way to process the language. In an experiment, a group of Dutch-English bilinguals heard words in both languages, Dutch and English, that were spoken by native speakers of one of the two languages. This experiment showed us three things. First, that the accentedness of the speaker affected the speed of responses of bilinguals. Second, that there was no reduction to the sensitivity of homophones, that is to say, that words that sounded similar in both languages were processed at a normal speed. And third, that even with the accented speech, both the L1 and the L2 were activated in the bilingual brain. The ability to speak a chosen language relies on the mechanisms that regulate the access to the cognitive control processes. These processes may be engaged differently in different forms of bilingualism, different language and cultural context. 
Let's set an example of Chinese English bilinguals in which English is the L2. Whenever they want to speak English, the L1 is blocked somehow. These bilinguals inhibit their L1 to enable speech in the L2. This inhibitory mechanism may be more difficult in the presence of L1 cues. For example, if these bilinguals are trying to explain a Chinese concept in English, the L1 may be activated. There are several prejudices that claim that learning a second language is boring and difficult. This prejudice, unfortunately, may affect the way children arrive at the classroom, most of the time unwilling to learn it. So, so at the moment of thinking about our teaching, we may consider two main factors, the age of our students, and their previous knowledge. We believe that learning through experience is the best way to create meaningful learning in our students, as this way of learning is learning through doing and experiencing. So, one fact which is really important about teaching through experience is that learners process knowledge in a more meaningful manner. This can be related to Ullmann's theory about memories. He mentions two kinds of memories, procedural memory and declarative memory. Procedural memory is based basically in performing tasks without conscious awareness, whereas declarative memory consists of recollecting or retrieving all memory. So, taking all this into account, and as future teachers, we thought that it is necessary to use activity in which students rely on procedural memory rather than on declarative memory. In our lesson plan, our students are between 9 and 10 years old. The topic being introduced is action verbs related to abilities, such as jump, swim, run, and one others. It is proved that if students perform the actions such as swimming, running, or playing the piano, the acquisition of the language or the vocabulary will be much easier and more meaningful than if they just learn the items in isolation.